Aloha, and this is The Art of Life. I'm your host, Willow Chang Alion, and we broadcast live every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m., and it is the glorious Friday the 13th. Here is a little bit of trivia for you out there watching. We had two Friday the 13th, two, count them, one last month in February and one in the month of March. What is the world coming to? And to keep with that theme of the unusual, the unspeakable, the unthinkable, <laughs> I think I just gleeked on the table right there. I was that excited. We have none other than <laughs> Miss Shelly Catwings Hello. in the house. <laughs> and um, well, we're kind of on a roll here. All the clothes are staying on. Don't get that excited. But you will have your mind and everything else stimulated. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. As with many of our guests here in the Art of Life, Everyone is busy. I always say you need to have like 10 heads because you can yeah. easily wear 10 <laughs> hats or 10 Definitely. sets of earrings or 10 flowers. My, my uh, nickname is the cat of all trades. I so. like <laughs> it. So I'm going to just go right to the heart of the matter because some people who are obviously uninjumicated, but that's why we're here, they were like, cat wings, what an interesting name. Now, explain <laughs> to us that. I, I know the visual on it, but tell us about the cat wings. Okay, well, um, uh, cat wings first started when I actually got a tattoo on my back. It's, it's a cat not a with little my, tiny no, one. It it's covers not a my twee entire little back. basic girl. It's <laughs> so it's, it's on my entire back, <laughs> and um, I got a cat with wings tattooed on me. And um, it became a nickname. And I was actually DJing at KTUH, right. the college radio station, as we were talking about earlier. Um, and it became my DJ name, so DJ Catwings. And then I started performing and doing burlesque, and then it became my stage name, so it became Miss Catwings. <laughs> now you can write the biography. So I like to add, you mentioned a couple of things, so we're just going to be a okay. freeform association as we often are here. You talked about being a DJ and then parlaying or going into performance. I'm curious, how does your love for music affect the choices you make as a performer? Because I really think that people who are their musicians or if they're DJs or, or whatever it is, that really enhances their uh, choices that they make, their creative process. How do you think music has affected um, your outlook? Um, well, as a performer, I think that, I don't know, everyone chooses, as a burlesque performer mm -hmm. or a dancer, um, everyone chooses their music or their performance different ways. Right. So sometimes people can be inspired by a song or a costume or an idea and build around that. Um, usually I get inspired by either a song mm -hmm. or a costume idea. And Which comes first? Is it a coin flip? It depends, yeah. I guess, what it is. But sometimes I hear a song and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to perform to that. And then I'll, I actually have a kind of a log of songs that, <laughs> like, songs I would like to perform to. Yeah. <laughs> we, and we, I just keep that. We nerds do this type of thing, <laughs> yeah. the archival process. I'm glad I'm not the only one that does no. <laughs> Well, because I'm always afraid that I'm going to forget that cool exactly. song. So if I don't write it down or make a play, Or I'll use Spotify when I hear mm. a song yeah. so I don't forget. Okay. And then I just keep it in a log. And then later on, when I'm trying to come up with a number, I go back to that and see and look at all the songs and listen to them and see which one inspires me for that particular number that I'm trying to do. So Akamai. So <laughs> I have to confess, I had the pleasure of seeing you perform two months ago at Hula's. She's like, what is oh. she going to talk about? <laughs> and you help resurrect uh, the affinity for a song that it seems like everybody and their mother loves, which is Pharrell Williams' Happy. Oh. Now, now, <laughs> lest you think that this song has been completely played out, you gave it the defibrillator and did this <laughs> amazing performance. I want to say assholes. Is that, is that the um, right term? There's a term. There are a couple of terms. Um, some people call them assholes. Some people don't like that term, and then they call them asties, like pasties, but asties. Oh, it's there's, there's a like a tassel. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Assholes yeah. or asties. So assholes as in tassels or asties as in pasties. Yeah, very interesting. I'm actually teaching a class next month on how to spin pasties and assholes, whatever you want to call them. Tassels. Oh it's called tassels and assholes <laughs> at the Academy of Teas. We can definitely uh, discuss that on Twitter if you want to take a vote on that. <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious, you seem to use humor a lot. In, I, I do. mean, 
I know I've seen things with pineapples and all kinds of stuff. You always find a way to interject humor into something that's a little cheeky and a little <laughs> saucy and, and, and always fun. And what is the, the root of that um, inspiration? Like, how do you find that balance to keep it cheeky and, and fun? Uh, well, for me, with the art of burlesque, mm -hmm. um, I think that initially everybody finds their niche, right, right. When, they when they perform, when they dance, whatever they do. And um, for me, when I was first starting out with burlesque, you know, I tried the just being sexy thing. And it's hard. It's actually one of the hardest things to do, be sexy while you perform. Um, so initially, actually, you know, I, I realized that I really liked my sense my, with my sense of humor, mm -hmm. that comedy would work with right. burlesque. And the art of burlesque anyway kind of has that in its origins. It's always, you know, making fun at what's going on. So right. um, before the dance and, you know, the art of the striptease was incorporated into it, the art of burlesque was with the comedians, the baggy pants comedians and, you know, all of that, right? <laughs> One exactly. of those vaudeville horns. Yeah, vaudeville. A pie so, in the face. Exactly. Yeah. Pie in the face, physical comedy, um, humor, um, lowbrow comedy. Um, so I kind of think I found my niche with that. And I like personally to incorporate comedy into yeah. performing. Um, and funny enough, you know, some ideas that I have, people are like, that was so weird or so hilarious, but sexy. And I don't know how I feel about that. I would and add absurdist. There's an absurd, element yeah. of absurdist Definitely. humor to your um, your performances that I actually love. I mean, it's, it's an acquired <laughs> taste if you like absurdist humor, but it's hard to do well. And I would say that every time I've seen you, it's like, well, really, it's you. just spot on. I appreciate on. it. Really. Now, I feel like that those elements of being able to parlay um, your musical uh, preferences and then also your comedic timing and then your sense of timing as a performer. Clearly, you're making the jump and the leap now into theater, yeah. shall we say it like that, <laughs> acting. And With R.E. Yeah, and you've got <laughs> this fantastic production that's coming up later this month called A Slice of Danger. Slice of so Danger. So tell I'm us sure. about how you made the leap from one type of performance into another, because they're both, they have both have theatrical components to them. Yeah. Um, well, I used to be in a burlesque troupe, mm -hmm. Cherry Blossom Cabaret, okay. and um, we used to always do theatrical productions, theatrical burlesque shows. Right. So a burlesque show with a story, and um, it's been over a year since I left them, and I've been kind of just performing by myself and um, with Lola, who you had on the show the other week, right. um, and um, I had still, from then, I had actually directed one of our shows. Mm -hmm. I directed a theatrical show. It was called Last Chance Saloon. Okay. And it was a burlesque comedy um, with singing, actually. It was a musical comedy with burlesque. Um, and I had a whole lot of fun producing that and directing it. And I kind of got an itch from there. And I had wanted to originally actually do a film noir show, but it just wasn't in the cards at the time. So, um, you know, years later now, it, that was 2012, I okay. think. The and year that things were supposed to end, the world was supposed to end in 2012. Again. <laughs> and, we're still, and we're still here. <laughs> but, um, you know, 2012 and, um, you know, time went along and things happened and life happens and whatnot. And I had still wanted to do a film noir play. Mm -hmm. um, originally, I'd wanted to incorporate dance into it. But, um, you know, I had actually originally commissioned Garrick Paikai, um, who's actually my lead actor now in the show, to write it. And Who he has just got the loudest voice <laughs> on the island? It's amazing and how it does. it's he does, booming. He has a presence. He definitely yeah, has a presence. Absolutely. You might know him from the mattress, the wholesale mattress ad. What's funny enough is that when I showed my mom the flyer mm -hmm. and invited my family to the show, the first thing out of her mouth was, "That's the guy from the mattress commercial, <laughs> isn't it?" But anyway, yeah. but um, yeah, I had wanted to still write a play and. Um, I had asked him to do it, and he was just too busy. He's the director for On the Spot Improv and also runs the Improvaganza Improv Comedy Festival, right. only one in Hawaii. And um, I was just like, well, okay, I guess this is going to go on the back burner again. And um, uh, Improver, uh, Jasmine Fernandez, was actually like, hey, why don't you do it yourself? 
you know? Ooh. Set deadlines for yourself, set goals, and why don't you write it? And I, was, I thought to myself, I was like, well, hmm, why don't I write it? Even though I haven't written in over a decade since college. Um, but why don't I write it? So I set deadlines for myself. I put it on the Arts of Mars calendar. I, you know, started trying to think about it. And the biggest problem actually that I had was that I had all of my actors, mm -hmm. all of my cast, and originally I'd want dancers, but just didn't work out. So I ended up keeping it just to a play. And December came along and my rehearsals were supposed to start in January and I still didn't have a script. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but I had set these deadlines and I had set these goals and everyone was so excited about the project. And I was just like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? I had writer's block. And so eventually, you know, I, I finally got inspired and I, I got it out and I got the rough draft out, the first act. And we came to the first rehearsal and um, everybody, you know, did a reading and everybody loved it. And so, you know, Garrick at that time, since he was my lead actor, came back to me and was like, hey, you know, I think this is great, but I think if you're open to it, these are the things that it's lacking. Mm -hmm. Do you need help? So I was like, sure, like anything. And actually he was afraid that I was gonna say no and that he'd have to drop out of the play. Um, but I was like, no, like, of course, like I would love your input. You know, this is my first time I'm actually writing a play right. and I would love it. So he helped me with certain things like, you know, oh, this is what it needs and this is what you're missing. He's great at, at improv. And so we did a couple of um, improv rehearsals to kind of work things out because there were certain things in the script that were being forced and mm -hmm. weren't really working out. So with his background, of course, in improv, we worked that out in rehearsals, which inspired me and him. And we rewrote things and worked it out and finally came up with and the voila. script. So, so he's my co-writer on it that's and amazing. Fantastic. <laughs> so let me, I'm gonna, doo -doo -doo, I'm gonna wind it back a little because you've said many, many interesting things. You talk about the improvisational process or element. So tell us, is that uh, something that allows you guys to be interactive with the audience and to respond who's there or their plot? changes or without giving a whole lot away how does the, the improvisational part come into play the, in the play, play itself mm -hmm. is um pretty scripted mm -hmm. there's not really actually a lot of room for improv okay. um the improv aspect was more a part of the creative process right which helped a lot and especially one of the characters i actually don't think one of the characters would have been kept in the play if it wasn't for um my actress christina ueno yeah who's actually now with Hawaii Theater for Youth. Ooh. She's just one of their new actresses, so it's awesome. Okay, I'm cool. glad to have her, and also um, Amrita Malik, who plays my other ensemble character. So um, the improv aspect, um, there's a, a little room for improv in the show, but I would say most of it's scripted. Right, because then it yeah. could just veer off. But it really quick. did help with the, with the, the um, writing process and coming up with the characters. Okay. And um, the actors really put in their, they infuse the characters with life. You know, otherwise it would just be boring on paper. And we never went boring on paper or in real life, but we must take a small break. We'll be right back. This is the art of life. Here's the deal. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. We call it Energy Wednesday every Wednesday. <laughs> Are you surprised? Okay, and we and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. <laughs> Clean energy is major. Okay, and that's why we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from 4 to 5, and we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here today. You've seen this. You heard what she said. What do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes, there isn't a good forum to bring these key issues out into the public, and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential. 
to keep talking about energy because as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table being discussed that will affect us all going forward. So uh, come join us. And if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll, we'll put you up here and, uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be, from Think Tank's point of view, it's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our, it's our most important <laughs> show. So come around and listen to us 4 to 5 on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. If you're just joining us, you can catch the first half of the show up on our archives. Those are all housed away for your convenience and viewing pleasure on both YouTube. You can check it out on thinktechhawaii.com, or you can go to the Art of Life with Willow Chang page at Facebook, like us. That's me politely begging for your like. I'm not too ashamed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you can't really have a lot of shame if you're in the world of the arts. And uh, my guest, Ms. Cat Wings, and I know a little bit about that. You shameless self-promotion. Sh shameless, right whatever here. it is. You know, um, <laughs> what's the strangest venue that you have ever performed in? For me, it was doing a belly gram at Slim's Power Tools for a birthday. Strangest place I've ever performed. Oh, actually, it was at J.J. Dolan's, my sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> it's a plug and the truth. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a plug and the truth. Uh, actually, uh, Lola Love and I mm -hmm. got asked to perform at uh, Wake. Oh, wow. At J.J. Dolan's. Let's just clarify that. That's the party <laughs> you have when someone has passed away. Yeah. So, um, uh, former NFL pro football player John mm -hmm. Wilbur. Okay. Um, they had his wake at J.J. Dolan's, and we got asked to perform burlesque at his wake in the middle of the day. I think it was like noon or one o'clock at J.J. Dolan's in front of all these people. But uh, for people that are familiar with John Wilbur, he was friends with people like Hunter S. Thompson. Oh. And he was kind of a rowdy guy. Yeah. So his daughter hired us and said that his dad would have, her dad would have loved having us. So that was the weirdest thing that ever happened. I, I but think amazing. That trumps power tools anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I almost thought you were going to say that you had pizza on you and people were pulling slices off no, of your not body. Quite. Okay. No. Um, <laughs> wow. It's pretty phenomenal stuff. Let's talk a little bit about JJ Dolan's for the uninitiated, perhaps the finest pizza in Honolulu. I could go on camera and say that. I'm not related to anybody there or any pizza makers whatsoever. And or paid. Or paid. <laughs> I wish we had pizza here today. Um, I remember the first time I had a slice, and I don't know why there was like this mystique of J.J. Dolan's. And then I had a slice, and I completely understood why I there love is. J.J. Dolan's. Wow. Wow, it's wow, two wow. Two guys from New York in Chinatown. It tastes like pizza, pizza from New York, you know? Yeah. You fold it in <laughs> half and you put it inside. Yeah. J.J. Dolan's is our awesome sponsor for the show. I, writing a film noir comedy about pizza, yeah. I thought we needed a pizza sponsor. And they're so right in the course, hood. The first person that I asked was uh, J.J. Newber from J.J. Dolan's. And uh, amazingly, him and Danny said yes. And um, it's the first actual play they've ever sponsored. So they're super stoked about it. They um, actually, on the Slice of Danger t-shirt, if you look at the back, it's got the I Shamrock Pizza How logo befitting. on it. So they are stoked about it. You've got the luck of the eye ever on your shirt there. <laughs> um, yeah, they've actually made these amazing um, uh, ads mm -hmm. for the program and actually they put them up around Chinatown Great. but um, it says uh, one slice deserves another come <laughs> to come get a piece of pie after the show 
I like it. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm curious about this cross-pollinization because it's the one thing that kind of plagues artists no matter where you are is the issue of funding. The dirty F word is funding and, yes. and trying to find <laughs> the ways to put together production because it isn't as simple as, oh, we've got five people and we all love doing this and we all do our hair and makeup. Exactly. And you, there's so many hidden expenses that most people yeah. don't think about. And so you approach them. Did this mean that you had it allowed you to forego having to crowdfund or, or have bake sales or car washes or any of the, the multitude of things yeah. that people do? So the one thing that I really didn't want to do was do a crowdfunding mm -hmm. project. Um, and I surely couldn't afford to produce the show myself. Yeah. So initially when I had this project and because of the storyline, I had thought to uh, you know approach J.J. Dolan's and if they didn't respond, then other pizza places in Chinatown. Um, but um, yeah, it's people don't realize how much a production really costs. You know, they just think, oh well, the price of that ticket is so expensive and whatnot. But you know, after you uh, have to, you know, you have to think of costumes and props and the set design, mm -hmm. and then you have to pay all of the tech, and then really in theater, the actors seem to come last. So the one thing that I wanted to do with the show was that I wanted to get a sponsor um, so that we could actually pay the actors, which seems like a novel idea, right? Right. Um, and they're not paid in pizza. They're, they're paid in actual they're money. They're not paid in Ooh. pizza. <laughs> We'd all be very big on carbohydrates. And roll and, onto the stage. Yeah. <laughs> but um, um, lucky enough, you know, J.J. Don said yes, and, um, you know, they gave us some monetary as well as actually pizza yeah. for our after party. Um, but also, um, uh, so JJ Dolan's is our big cheese sponsor. That's fantastic. And um, also actually uh, we have a private sponsor, um, Andy Konopka, who is our private eye sponsor. And so lucky enough we were able to raise that money um, to cover the initial costs of production so that all the money from the proceeds of the show can actually go in to pay all of our actors and all of our tech and, you know, we can actually do this, and it's not just a labor of love. I need to make the small claps. I'm Lulu Chang, and I approve of that concept. It's, a, it's an awesome <laughs> one. And that's wonderful to, yeah. to use the cliche to think outside of the pizza box. There we um, go. <laughs> very, very good. And I feel like, you know, I think it's one of the sentiments you hear people say is, well, in these hard times, in these hard times, we have to think. It's like, yeah. Even if times aren't hard, it, I think everybody benefits from doing collaboration because it allows them to step out of their comfort zone or to s assume new responsibilities or to have ownership within their community. I mean, mm -hmm. J.J. Dillon's is right there in Chinatown, and Lord yeah. knows enough people go and, and buy a slice who would probably come to the show. So it's a nice, yeah. it's a marriage made in heaven. Yeah, Vat I'm really excited alike. about it. Let's talk about film noir, because for those who are not cinephiles, they might be unfamiliar with the gumshoe and uh, the private eye and the femme fatale and all of the various hallmarks of what goes into film noir. So when you were in the process of writing your play, um, what were the things that you felt were essential to convey uh, the essence of what's called film noir? So um, really with this production, um, film noir, you know, visually, of course, um, I wanted it to be black and white. So we have Cora Yamagata, who is our lighting designer, and who is um, hopefully going to be um, getting my vision into mind um, when you see these black and white films. Film noir is black and white. Right. So um, the shades of gray. obviously, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't want my actors to get into black and white, full body black and white makeup, because that's an ordeal. Plus that gets on the costumes mm -hmm. and that's just, it's just a lot, you yeah. know, we're not Broadway production. So um, I enlisted Corey Yamagata and she was excited about the show. And, um, you know, we have our tech this Sunday, Hell Week. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll be seeing that. And I tried to make most of the costumes neutral mm -hmm. looking so that it would play that kind of black and white in the performance as well. So will that so. be perhaps using um, the lighting to create tonalities or shades of gray? Yeah, or exactly. Okay, and then also yeah. using shadows, so things that yeah, would kind of be in a hot spot, too. like bathed in light versus some things that are kind Correct. of... Correct. Wow. Yeah, so I'm exciting. hoping she has this gobo that's going to set up so that we kind of get that shadowy look. 
and um, also some of the harsh spotlights and things that our detective, you know, will be in. Um, but yeah. You mentioned <laughs> earlier that your original vision um, was going to include dancers, but for for whatever reasons, that wasn't in the cards, and you have the show, which I think it's interesting because a lot of times people think the final product is it's exactly as you originally uh, <laughs> like the costume looks exactly how you sketched it or the song right, like right, started right. off but it goes through so many shifts and changes and there's a really nice feeling when you can accept what it's become or you realize that the way it is now is exactly the way it's supposed to be exactly. so at what point did you say ah, I don't need those dances the show is choice the way it is but <laughs> <laughs> Well, as I said, you know, in December, yeah. when um, I had I had actually done a virtual audition, and actually a lot of dancers I knew uh, were really interested in the project, um, and they all said they were going to audition and send me a video and do this and that, and things happen, yeah. right? Um, so no one actually ended up auditioning for it. Um, there was Fringe Festival in February, yes, yes. so there were a whole bunch of people getting ready for that. There's a UH Manoa um, dance program uh, thing holds, this month. Yeah, and this also, yeah. And so there were a whole bunch of people that were involved with that. And so they were like, I can't do your show. I want to, but I can't. And so I was just like, you know what? I need to just step down. I don't even have my full script yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, since this is my first year producing this show, um, let me just take the dancers out of the equation. And maybe next year, if the show does well and if it's well received this year, wink. No. Um, <laughs> that you know, maybe next year we'll incorporate um, dancers into the show. And what actually inspired me was, um, you know, in the burlesque theater shows we did, we would always incorporate burlesque into it. And not necessarily that I wanted to incorporate burlesque one hundred percent into this, right. but dance in general. And um, I don't know if you saw um, Hawaii Shakespeare Festival this past yeah. year did a production. Oh, I can't remember which play, but they used avatars, huh. um, and they used um, two dancers um, in their show to kind of represent what the two kings mm. were feeling okay. and the mood of them in the show and moving them around the battleground. Fantastic. So I kind of was inspired by that, as well as old Hollywood movies, you know, yeah. Sid Charisse, and, you know, like all of those dancers back then, you know, Rita all Hayworth. beautiful, oh, la, la. Yeah. and they just kind of spoke that story, you know, and that's kind of what I wanted to do, but it wasn't in the cards this time. Oh, well, so. it's probably going to be the first of many. Yeah. Do you have plans to, uh, to immortalize it? You've talked about the photographer who created this, gener this fantastic yeah. image. Can you tell us again? We were talking about that off camera. <laughs> <laughs> so the photos that you've seen, um, that they've been kind mm -hmm. of splashing up there, yeah. are all by Shane Gillard um, of Firebird Photo. And um, he's an amazing self-taught photographer. His style is that classic um, kind of vintage look, um, play on nostalgia. Yeah. And um, actually, he's going to be doing a TED Talk on the art of nostalgia, or the, I can't remember what exactly he's it's called. He's speaking our language. On the 28th. <laughs> unfortunately, which is on the day of our show, but it ends early, so you can still come, go to that, and then come here. Yeah, um, two Come to Slice of Danger. But um, he did all the amazing photography, and um, we shot where his studio is located, um, in Chinatown, actually. That's and um, he was able to take these amazing photos and really capture um, the, the essence. essence of the show and the actors. Jinx. And he also came up with the awesome logo design, let me get up there. Um, the logo design, um, which is a slice of pizza with a knife sticking out of it. We have our little skull there and some bullets, as well as the broken heart there. The but he that look like a broken brought heart. my idea to life in t-shirts. That's fantastic. <laughs> so, yeah. Think about that and check out the website. We have to cut to our little break, but we're going to be back for part three on the art of life with Miss Cat Wings. Aloha, my name is Paul Jackson, better known as PJ, and my local interest is in sports. I have my own sports radio show at KWAI AM 1080 that you can stream live. 
I also have my own website, pjsportsradio.com. We have live guests in studio, and we talk about discussions and topics that everyone wants to know locally here on the islands. We cover everything from surfing to basketball to whatever's going on locally, sports-wise. We try to do our best and cover the topics in depth as much as we can. Once again, thank you for joining PJ here on Hawaii Sports Update. Mahalo. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. We're back, and this is The Art of Life. I'm your host, Willow Chang Alion. If you're just tuning in, well, my goodness, you've missed two halves. I should say two-thirds of a great show, <laughs> but you can watch it on YouTube. Our guest today is Miss. Cat Wings, a.k.a. Shelley, and uh, she is many things, a performer, a burlesque artist, a, oh, well, I guess we'd say a playwright, and as well as director and a producer, and yeah. all these things, <laughs> addicted a lot of to things. glitter. She doesn't have any glitter on, but I've seen it. Mermaid, I mean, too, actually. Oh, and, and mermaid. <laughs> so, you know, the business card will have many hyphenates. I wanted to ask you um, about what it was like to be a director. So you've mentioned that earlier in your previous life you have directed some shows with the Cherry Blossom Cabaret and here you have your own play and you're directing it. What is your uh, approach as a director? Because everyone has their various styles. Some are very minimal, some are like the actor whisperer, some people are dictatorial, maybe you have a writing crop, I don't know. <laughs> what, what's your style as a director? Um, for me, um, Garrick has actually been really helpful mm -hmm. in, um, I think I had certain things in my head that I really wanted it to work, but it only worked in my head. Mm -hmm. So he kind of... I hate of, it when that happens. I know, <laughs> I really do too. But um, a lot of things have worked that I did have in my head and luckily it came out, but there were other things that just weren't working. So he's kind of taught me to kind of just let things, let the actors do what naturally comes. Yeah. And if I love it, I t I'll tell them to keep it. And if I don't, I will tell them to try something else. So maybe more of so. a, an editing type of process as opposed to yeah. an additive process? Yeah, because I think that um, sometimes naturally actors kind of know what to do. They're, sometimes they, they think that, oh, is this me? Or is this the character? Or whatnot. And I think that it kind of has to be a fusion of both. You know, for example, like if you're holding a heavy prop gun and it's getting heavy and your hand is starting to go down, your natural reaction as an actor is probably just to try to keep it straight because you're trying to want it. Yeah. But naturally, in a situation, that it would probably get heavy. So you have to react to that as your character. But yes, it's getting heavy. Maybe you have to put two hands on it, yeah. you know, and things like that. So just... You know, I kind of like to see where people naturally go. And again, the improv process has been helpful. You know, you learn to really be like, well, if you're standing there, what's my reaction to you? Right. So the actors do that as well, right? So they feed off of each other naturally. You know, even though you're supposed to be in this spot, if something happens during the show and this actor misses their spot and they, they're over there, the other actor has to counteract that because otherwise it might look strange on stage. Right. So it's kind of been awesome to work with Garrick because he's also a producer and director and um, kind of learn from him. And I find that it's a much more welcoming style and um, much more loving to the actors. And everybody's happy and no one's mad at each other and, you know, that's Although I have, to do, I have to be stern sometimes and put my foot down, but, you know, I tell them <laughs> not to take it personally. Exactly. <laughs> it's not about you, but it's about you. You know, it's, <laughs> it's interesting because one of those, like, old adage, and, and I, I like to flip it into a joke, is like, associated with acting is, what's my motivation? You know, but I think that that's 
such an interesting and essential prompt. Yeah. Not only for your creative process or for acting, but in life. I mean, you can daily you should probably be asking yourself, what's my motivation? Totally. Which is like, why am I doing this? What's what's the purpose of this? What does it serve? What's the the outcome or the intention of yeah. it? And I think like in acting, that's super important because if you just go by rote and you remember things, but you're not responding to yeah. what's happening, that's when it feels stiff exactly. and wooden and it gets boring. Exactly. Ew. And and that's happened throughout the show. You know, sometimes the actor will do something and I'm like, I don't think that reads well, yeah. you know, and here I think you should do this and this is what maybe you should be thinking, you know? Yeah. And um, I think when I say it from that aspect, they're like, oh, well, this looks, this feels weird. I'm like, it may feel weird, but it looks great. So keep that, because I can see it. And that's actually also why people have been asking me, like, well, are you in the show? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I cannot be, I, I, I personally don't believe in being in a show that you are directing, especially because you can't 100% be, you can't 100% look at it objectively. Don't tell that to George Clooney. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, think it's, it, I think it's difficult to be a director and be in your own show because you just can't see all those little nuances. Yeah. And you're also too involved. I mean, it's very myopic. In this sure. show, I'm, I ha I'm wearing a lot of hats to begin with. You're actually Besides in the show. You're just actor. not on the stage. <laughs> yeah, I'm not on the stage. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I actually designed the makeup for the show and, you know, got all the costumes together, even though I have a costume manager, but I got all the costumes together. And being the pretty, worrying about the money, producing it, directing it, advertising the show, JJ everything. JJ Dolan's got a bargain because they don't have to pay <laughs> 10 other people exactly. because you did 10 jobs, yeah. basically. So, you know... Doing all of that already mm -hmm. is much, and I cannot imagine being in my own show as well. Yeah. Even if I had somebody cover all those other things. You, you need know. to be like Princess Leia with a little holographic, like, help me, Obi-Wan. You're, <laughs> you're my only hope. We'll just have you, like, you know. Pizza Wars. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask you something else. So I kind of I got a little detract, uh, a little sidetrack there. Sometimes Sorry, it happens, that. usually when I'm excited. <laughs> you have these wonderful shows that are up and coming. You have two weekends. Mm -hmm. uh, let me make sure I have the information correct. So Thursday on the 19th and the 26th, and then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and respectively 20, 27. So it's two weekends in a row. Let's make yes. life easy here. But then do you have other, have you cast aspirations to have the show in other places, like to go to Maui, to the Mac, or maybe to... Uh, produce a film or to see if you, you know, if you trademark your work and then have someone else, a small theater company in Ojai, California, do a slice of danger? I would love to. Um, I think it would be really awesome mm -hmm. if I could do this play elsewhere, but it would just be whether or not it would be feasible, especially yeah. monetarily feasible. How prints online. <laughs> Cool. Do you foresee yourself writing another play, or would you go maybe a more traditional route of working with a pre-existing uh, body of work? You know, um, I think if uh, the right play came along, I would probably love to direct a play that I really loved. But I really loved this process, mm -hmm. and um, writing an original work was really self-gratifying, and um, I think that other people love it too. Um, so actually, um, when you look at the flyer and the promotion for it, um, it says cha hashtag Chinatown HI mystery. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually had in mind that um, we could have other adventures with the detective Kamwala Ho. Yeah. Because um, there's actually a backstory in the play, which we'll use, you will see. There's uh, no spoilers there. But, um, you know, he's got some backstory and there's other history with a lot of other characters. And they feel that we could probably write some, you know, other stories on that. Absolutely. This just sounds like a whole barrel of monkeys of, like, real, just good old clean fun. It, it is. is PG-13. It's PG-13. So you can bring the little ones and have an adult present. And the jokes can... will go right over their head. Probably. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. You know, um, 
you talked about that lovely hashtag, the word that I can't stand but does so many magical things, but where else can people find out about the production and also about you as a performer? Uh, websites? Or um, so you. Um, if you want to find more information, you can go to my website, the808wonderland.com. And also, um, although I just noticed that it's spelled wrong down there, <laughs> Um, it's sliceofdanger.eventbrite.com, but it's B-R-I-T-E. Ah, so, <laughs> so cool. it's sliceofdanger.eventbrite.com, and you can find more information on there about how to buy tickets. And yay, yay correct, right there. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, um, find more information there. And on my website, the 808 Wonderland, actually links to my regular website, misscatwings.com, where you can find where I'm performing, which actually, if you looked on there, you could find that I'm performing tonight. Friday the 13th. Oh la la. <laughs> MissCatWings.com, is that correct? That's correct, MissCatWings.com. I'm One curious, word. are any of these shows going to have a meet and greet? Sometimes they do that, like after the show, people ask questions or... Um, so for this show, um, I mean, we, you know, after every show, we'll, of course, let the cast You'll come out. You'll meet your fans. And you can <laughs> meet, but as far as like a talk or something, yeah. no, not a talk. Okay. I didn't even think that people would want to do that at all. So. You, never, you just never know. <laughs> they can email me okay. at chinatownhimystery at gmail.com or go to my website. <laughs> Will the t-shirts be for purchase? Um, well, we did a pre-sale on t-shirts, so everybody that really wanted a t-shirt already bought one. Um, we have actually come, Blank Canvas, which is an, also a business in Chinatown, supporting Chinatown, um, printed the t-shirts. And we actually passed the deadline to order oh. by the show. But if people are really interested and they want to message me, they totally can and can buy the t-shirts for 20 bucks. We'll have very, very limited. And by limited, I probably mean only one to two sizes per <laughs> shirt. <laughs> because uh, without more people buying tickets right now, I don't know if I'm going to be able to afford it. And I don't really know if people want. So if you really do want a t-shirt, message us and we'll totally make it happen for you. Fantastic. <laughs> it sounds like a whole bunch of fun that's uh, at the end of this month, which is usually historically spring break, so you have no excuse yes. for all of you people out there. Oh, two I weekends. Oh, I've got papers. No, no, no. Spring break, two weekends. And Thursday through Sunday. Thursday through Sunday. What's not to like? Right? So you have eight chances to see the show. Not to mention, as I look at this, the show starts at eight. So any of you lackadaisical people who can't get your Okoli out of bed, you have plenty of time to shower and have exactly. dinner and find parking and everything else. And it and follows Phil's carpool. Yeah. And Catch Sunday them. it's at seven. Yeah. So, you know, you can still go to bed so that you can go to work the next morning. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Miss Cat Wings. It's been a pleasure and a joy to finally get you on the show and <laughs> nail your foot down. Yeah. And I'm sure we will have you again with the next creative adventure, which will probably be sooner than later, knowing oh, you. So, <laughs> thank you. This is The Art of Life. I'm your host, Willow Chang Alion, and we are keeping it Pono. Aloha.